Hello friends, welcome back to my channel Chemistry Tutorial. Today we are going to learn Arrhenius theory of electrolytes. There are many theories related to the dissociation of electrolyte in a solution and first we are going to learn the Arrhenius theory of electrolyte dissociation. So let's get started. And before that, if you have not subscribed to my channel, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon to get the notifications whenever I upload a new video. And now let's get started. These are some postulates of the Arrhenius theory of electrolytic dissociation. The first point you can see is when a particular electrolyte is dissolved in a solution, it splits into ions of opposite charges. And the positively charged ions are called cations and the negatively charged ions are called anions. This is a very basic thing we know we have already studied in our very low classes. And the second point is, the total charge on the cation will be equal and opposite to the charge on that of cat anion. So, if there is Ag+, plus, there is Cl-. minus. So, the cation has plus charge, 1 plus charge and the Cl is having a minus charge, that is 1 minus charge. So, it is equal and opposite in nature. And the third point, these two ions, the ions that are produced in a solution always exist in an equilibrium with the undissociated molecule. And this we say it is static equilibrium. And we represent this like this. If AB is an electrolyte, it gets dissociated into A plus and B minus. And there exists equilibrium. That is we have shown this arrow, equilibrium arrow. So there is a static equilibrium in this dissociation process. And the next point is, when electricity is passed through the solution having the electrolyte, only it will make the movement of the ions in the opposite direction. That is, the ions will be moving towards the oppositely charged electrode. So, only the electricity is having that action and it will not ionize a particular electrolyte in a solution. That is what the fourth point explained here. That is, ions are moving to are uh, made to move towards the oppositely charged electrodes and it does not produce ions in a particular solution only direct the motion of the ions and the fifth point is the properties of the electrolytes are mainly based on the properties of the ions so whatever properties the ions have that will be the property of the electrolyte so the properties of an electrolyte is mainly depending on the properties of the cations and the anions and the sixth point is, the fraction of total molecules ionized in a particular solution is called as degree of ionization. So, the degree of ionization is given by alpha and it is given by a formula like this. It is the ratio of the number of molecules dissociated. So, the number of molecules, if I have considered A, B, so the number of molecules dissociated into ions by the total number of molecules taken before dissociating. So that gives the degree of dissociation and the degree of dissociation depends on five properties and before that we will see this point also. The seventh point is properties like osmotic pressure, depression in freezing point, elevation in boiling point and lowering of vapor pressure is also exhibited by the electrolytes. Usually it is the properties of the molecules but here the ions also exhibit so, exhibit these properties and uh, due, due to this, there will be some variations in the properties of the electrolytes. So, the degree of dissociation depends upon these five factors. First, consider the nature of the electrolyte. So, consider an electrolyte, if it is a strong electrolyte, it will dissociate very fast or it acts as a strong electrolyte. For example, HCl and NaOH, it dissociates very fast and it is a very strong electrolyte and consider ammonium hydroxide and acetic acid they are very weak electrolytes and they dissociate slowly so this is one of the factor affecting the degree of dissociation and dilution on dilution the dissociation increases and on complete dilution the degree of dissociation goes to infinity that is called infinite dilution and the next one, temperature. We all know as common to dissolve something, we heat. 
we give some temperature in case of cooking and all so like the same when temperature is increased the dissociation also increases so this is the factor affecting degree of ionization and the next one is the nature of the solvent if the solvent we have taken is a high dielectric solvent like water then the degree of ionization increases and if we take a solvent which is having low dielectric nature like benzene the degree of ionization decreases and the next one is the presence of other ions like impurities so presence of other ions so presence of some impurities will automatically lowers or depresses the degree of ionization so these are the factors affecting the degree of ionization and these seven are the postulates of the arrhenius theory of electrolytic dissociation this theory mainly based on the weak electrolytes so next we are going to discuss the evidences supporting the arrhenius theory of dissociation of electrolytes so first is the validity of ohms law so how can we determine whether the ohms law is obeyed or not so when a small amount of current is passed immediately the electrolysis starts and the ions start moving towards the oppositely charged electrodes so it means the current applied is utilized only to make the ions to move and not to break the electrolyte into ions so this shows that the electricity passed is only to overcome the resistance and not to break the ions and now the electrolytes obey the ohms law so the second one is heat of neutralization let us take 1 g equivalent of a strong acid like hcl or h2so4 or hno3 and also a very strong base like naoh on reaction we get nacl water and some amount of energy that is 13700 calories which is a very common in case of all any reactant we take like any strong acid we take hcl or hno3 or h2so4 so it means that the 13700 calories arises from the heat from the neutralization of this products this means the 13700 calories is from the formation of water from h plus and oh minus and this shows that the strong acid and the strong base are completely ionized in the solution so that's the reason the value of energy released remains common or remains the same in all the cases and the third point is the presence of ions in solid state so consider nacl in the solid state or a crystal so in the crystal state nacl does not exist as nacl we know each na plus ion is surrounded by six cl minus ions and each cl minus ion is surrounded by six nacl ions so there exist ions inside the crystal lattice in a 6 to 6 coordination number but they don't conduct but once they are dissolved in a particular solvent the ions move apart from each other and so now the conduction can easily occur so this is the third point which shows the presence of ions in a electrolyte in a solid state also and next one is the color the color of certain salts are due to the presence of some ions for example if cu2 plus is there it gives a blue color like we know for copper sulfate and for cobalt compounds cobalt salts we have a light pink color and fe3 plus is suppose present it gives a yellow color if fe2 plus is there we get a light green color so the ions is also a factor for giving the color for an electrolyte and next let us consider ionic reactions as a proof for the formation of ions so consider the reaction of ammonium hydroxide with a ion compound like fecl3 here you can see fe3 plus and cl minus can be formed when the reaction occurs so in this case we get feoh so ion hydroxide which will have a brown color or a brown precipitate will be formed but the next say, next reaction if we see it is a coordination compound that is k3 fecl6 potassium ferrocyanate with the same ammonium hydroxide but can you expect any color here no because the fe cannot be ionized only if the ions are present the color will be seen so this is also an evidence for the formation of ions when dissolved in a particular solvent okay 
So next is the colligative properties. We know colligative properties like osmotic pressure, lowering of vapor pressure, elevation and boil point, depression and freezing point. All these four factors depend upon the number of particles. And let us consider a decimal solution of urea and decimal solution of glucose. They both have the same colligative property. For consider osmotic pressure, they both have the same value if we take decimal quantity of both urea and glucose. But if we take a decimal quantity of NaCl under the same condition, we will have twice the value. Why so? So, here you can see it is glucose, three molecules. For example, let us consider three molecules. When dissolved in a particular solvent also, it will remain the same. But if NaCl, if we are adding three units of NaCl, it ionizes into Na plus Cl minus. So, it becomes six. So, here you can see the blue dots are Na plus and the red one are Cl minus. So, here you can see six molecules are produced. So, six particles are formed inside that. So, the value becomes doubled. So, this is also a proof for the formation of ions. And the next one is the conductivity. When we are diluting a particular solute, the degree of ionization goes on increasing. So, the number of ions in the solution will also increase and with, with increase in the ions, the conductance can also be increased. So, the conductivity increases on dilution, on increasing the dilution and it reaches the maximum at infinite dilution. And the next one is the Ostwell dilution law. Ostwell dilution law is also obeyed by the electrolytes. So, here you can see these are the validity or the proofs for or the evidences supporting the Arrhenius theory of dissociation of electrolytes. This is, uh, Oswald dilution law is mainly based on the dissociation of the weak electrolytes. So next we are going to learn the limitations of the Arrhenius theory of the dissociation of electrolytes. The first point is the failure of the Oswald dilution law with Arrhenius theory when it is applied to the strong electrolytes. So, this theory is mainly based on the weak electrolytes. That is, Oswald dilution law is mainly based on the weak electrolyte dissociation. When it is applied to strong electrolytes, it failed. And the next point is, the strong electrolytes conduct the electricity in molten states also. According to Arrhenius theory, the ions conduct electricity only when they are dissolved or dissociated in a particular solvent. But consider NaCl or some other AgCl. When it is heated, it goes to a molten state and there is no need for dissociation of these ions in solution by the water or some other solvent. It conducts electricity in its molten state itself. So, here also the Arrhenius theory fails. And the third point is, it explains the existence of ions. If according to Arrhenius theory, when a particular electrolyte is dissolved in a particular solvent, the ions are formed. But it does not explain how these ions are formed in the solution. So that is the third point or the third limitation. And the fourth limitation is it does not account for this particular fact that the mobility of ions can be varied by the electrostatic forces of attraction and repulsion between the cations and the anions. So due to the attraction between the attraction or repulsion between those ions, there may be some effects in the mobility of the ions. So, it is not explained by the Arrhenius theory. And the next one is colligative properties. When it comes to the values of colligative properties having bivalent electrolytes like MgSO4, that is Mg2 plus and SO4 2 minus, it, the, there is some variation in values. But we learned the example of NaCl. In that case, it will be all okay. But when we consider a bivalent electrolyte, there are some problems. So, it is not explained by Arrhenius theory. And the next one is, it does not explain the variation of transport number with concentration. In the previous video, we have learnt about the transport number and the determination of transport number. And you can check the link in the description. And in that, we have learnt that the concentration change can be used to find the transport number of a particular ion. So, we know that the transport number varies with concentration. But INS theory does not explain that factor also. And it does not explain this fact also that is the equilibrium constant vary with concentration but Arrhenius theory failed to explain this. Similarly there is another study that is heat of neutralization decreases with increase in concentration but according to Arrhenius theory the heat of neutralization remains the same in all cases 
but actually the heat of nucleation decreases with increase in concentration so these are some limitations of the arrhenius theory so this is all about arrhenius theory okay friends i hope you all understood the topic if the session was useful please give a like and share to all your friends and don't forget to subscribe to our channel chemistry tutorial if you want me to ex explain any other topics also you can drop it in the comment section see you all in the next video thank you